good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are and what time of day it is when you watch this video. My name is Z, and welcome back to my gaming corner. In this episode, this very special episode of Diablo 3, I'm going to be showing you the brand new rework of the Talrasha set. And with the new items and the new legendary powers that Blizzard has introduced with the brand new patch in preparation for Season 27, this set is now completely bonkers. <laughs> so, let's get into it right now. If you remember the old school Tau Rasha, you had to cast Fire, Lightning, Arcane, and Cold, and you would get a stack of Tau Rashas, and every time you cast one of those abilities, you get a Meteor of the same damage type falling from the sky, and there was an 8 second cooldown on the Meteors that could spawn. So if you cast a Fire Meteor, you had to wait 8 seconds before another Fire Meteor would fall. Okay, that's gone. What you used to know about Tau Rashas, just toss it in the trash, it... Welcome to a brand new world. The new Tau Rashas, like I said, with the new legendary powers, is absolutely bonkers. So I have called this Tau Rashas Bombardment, because that's what we're going to be doing. So let's let's start with the gear for both yourself and your follower, then we'll go over the skills, and then I will show you what this looks like in action. So starting with the gear. Now there has been a debate online and in YouTube videos from uh, Max Roll, from Ujido, from Rax, to JJ, to Filthy Casual. I've, I've watched a whole bunch of videos. I've done my own research. I've gone to maxroll.gg, looked at their build guide that was written by Chewy, which is a really, really, really good build guide. And then I've been playing around with this, doing my own testing, looking at my own stuff. And I have found my own personal play style that I love. And this, this build, like I said, is, it's just completely bonkers. So I have chosen to take Aetherwalker. And please note that for the purpose of this video, I have not tried to min-max anything. In a few places I rolled a socket where I didn't have a socket so I could put a gem in. In a few places I rolled um, some more cooldown reduction or some more intelligence or more whatever I needed. But I haven't really gone through and looked at each piece of gear. It's like, okay, I can take this skill. I haven't done any min-maxing at all. So I've chosen to take Aetherwalker for the simple reason that Teleport no longer has a cooldown but then instead costs 25 arcane power. And like, if you look down on the thing below the 12 max marking power in the socket, you'll see that little circle there that says reduce all resource costs by 10%. That is a maximum. It can, if you roll that, it can be anywhere between 8 and 10%, but it's all random. I was able to get 10% on resource cost reduction. And let me give you a fair warning, if you're going to play what I affectionately call Taurash's Bombardment, you need to have a super, super high resource cost reduction. I would recommend at least, bare minimum, 50%, 5-0% resource cost reduction. If we look at my stats down here in resource, my cost reduction is at 46.68, but if you look really carefully at my Paragon, I oh, whoops, if we go to my Paragon, you'll notice that I have not put in any of my Paragon. That way I can show you just a level playing field, no Paragon, no min-maxing, no optimized gear, I'm basically using potato gear, it's just garbage gear, but it's still completely bonkers and it still dominates, it's beautiful. So if I added in that resource cost production all the way to 50, for example, it would give me an additional 10 resource cost reduction. So that would then put me over the 50% that I need, and you're there, you're golden. I'm not doing that. So I'm stuck at 46% resource cost reduction, and it's pretty close to 50. It works. You'll see my... Arcane power just nudge down just a little bit, but with 50% resource cost reduction, it doesn't move at all. So I'm at 46, almost 47% resource cost reduction, and this build requires a bunch of resource cost reduction. So I rolled resource cost reduction on my weapon, and I'm using Aetherwalker so I can just zip around with teleport. 
Now, if you remember from the old school Tal Rasha, if you wanted to take teleport, you had to. You were required to take the teleport calamity rune. Because the Calamity Rune says, emit a short range wave of force when you teleport, and that would satisfy the arcane requirement for Talrosh's elements. No longer the case. And I will, I will explain why a little bit later in the video. So for our weapon, we're taking, we're taking Aether Walker. Now, let's look at the gear and the new set bonuses for Talrosha. The two set bonus says thus... Damaging enemies with arcane, cold, fire, or lightning will grant immunity to that element. Okay, let's think about that for just a minute. I've been playing Wizard since Diablo 3 released back in 2012 on the PC. And then it came out on console a year later on PlayStation 3. And then the Ultimate Evil Collection came out for PlayStation 4, and I have upgraded to the PlayStation 5 version. But I've been playing Wizard exclusively. Like, I don't play Demon Hunter. I don't play War, uh, Barbarian or Crusader or Witch Doctor or Necro. I am a wizard. I have been playing Wizard since the beginning, and I absolutely adore the wizard. I love the wizard. I love how cocky he is, but I've been playing Wizard for a very long time, um, almost 11 years on Wizard, which is insane. But yeah, so damaging enemies with arcane, cold, fire, or lightning grants immunity to that element. So playing wizard for so long, I can tell you that wizards have always been susceptible to fireballs, casted fire things from the cultists or the, the evil mages from the Temple of the Firstborn or the winged flayers from Act 3. They shoot huge fireballs at you. You die almost instantly if you get hit with a fireball. Guess what? If you're casting fire spells and you're immune to fire, no longer an issue. Okay, so it grants immunity to the element when you cast the element. And then it will cause a meteor of the same damage type to fall from the sky. Okay, so we still have Tal Rosh's set casting meteors with us. Okay, cool. Now, this only occurs... So here's a requirement now. The, the eight-second... Um, cooldown is gone, but now there's a requirement for Talrasha, and it says, this only occurs if the wizard has Meteor on their action bar. Okay, so now you have to take the Meteor skill, which makes Talrasha a Meteor build. Okay, cool. And then, <laughs> this is where they eliminated the 8 second cooldown, the same Meteor cannot happen twice in a row. Well, if you're casting a whole bunch of fire skills, and you have a little bit of arcane going off, a little bit of lightning going off, and it's going between arcane, lightning, fire, arcane, lightning, fire, Talrashas will always be casting meteors with you, no longer with an 8-second cooldown. That is just bonkers in and of itself. But we're going to take bonkers to the nth degree with what we're going to do to meteors. Okay, the four set bonus says, Arcane, Cold, Fire, and Lightning attacks each increase all of your resistances by 100% for eight seconds. Attacking with Meteor, so, so we're, getting, we're getting a 100% boost to each of our resistances when we attack with the different elements. So we're getting a 400% reduction 400% uh, increase to our resistances, but because it's a fire resisted 100% and an arcane resisted 100%, we're basically increasing our damage reduction by like 62-63%, which is pretty cool. And then, more on the four set bonus, attacking with Meteor reduces the cooldown of Teleport by one second. Um, okay, well Teleport has normally an 11 second cooldown, and if you attack with Meteor, it reduces it by one second. If you attack with Meteor Shower, you get a six second reduction per Meteor Shower. Cast that three times, you're done. Even casting it twice with six Meteors, 12 second to 11 second, you're done. So cast Meteor twice, teleport, cast Meteor twice, teleport. Cool, right? So if you take the Meteor Shower rune, you can cast Meteor twice, your teleport's reset. Teleport, zip around, Meteor Shower. But because we're taking Aether Walker, we can just zip around without worrying about it. Okay, but that 100% bonus to your resistances for your elements for 8 seconds, we're increasing the bonkers a little more. Now, the 6-piece bonus. 
<laughs> this is where it gets super bonkers. So attacks increase your damage by 2,000%. Basically multiplying your damage by 1,900 times. Because an increase of 2,000%, you're taking your damage, my damage right now on my one damage right there over 824,000, take 824,000, multiply it by 1,900. Let me just grab my calculator really fast. We're turning my damage from 824,000 into... <laughs> 824,000 multiplied by 1,900 is 1 billion, B with a billion, 565,600,000. Okay. Now, it gets more bonkers than that. So attacks increase your damage by 2,000% or multiplied by 1,900 for 8 seconds. Arcane Cold Fire and Lightning attacks each add one stack. Okay, now we now we now need to increase that. So the 2,000% is one stack. We're going to add three more to that. So multiply that by three, which takes our damage from 824,000 to 4 billion, B for billion, 696,008, oh I'm sorry, 4 billion, 696 million, 800,000. Okay, that's just sheet damage. That's before elemental damage is involved. So our base damage of 824K, 824,000, goes to 4.69 billion, which is bonkers. Okay? Absolutely beautiful. And then each different elemental attack extends the duration by two seconds. But because of a change that Blizzard made to the requirements for Taurash's elements, one of our skills will constantly be proccing when we cast Meteor. So there's our two things. So all we do is cast Meteor. And because of one of our passive skills, we'll always be refreshing that bonus when we cast Meteor because that other skill is also going off. So we'll constantly have a four stack of Taurashas at all times, which is insanity to the max. It's completely bonkers. So the gear that you need for Taurashas, you need the gloves, the chest piece, the helmet, the amulet, and the offhand of Taurashas. Try and find ancients, try and find primal ancients. Um, try and get your crit chance up, try and roll area damage, try and roll resource cost reduction. So the pieces that can have resource cost reduction is your offhand, your helmet, your gloves, your weapon, and both of your rings and amulets. They can all have resource cost reduction to a maximum of 8% for everything, 10% on your weapon. So if you have rings, two rings at 8%, your offhand at 8%, that's 24%. 8% on your amulet, that's going to be 32%. 8% on your helmet, 8% on your gloves, 10% on your weapon. So 5 at 8, 40%, so you can have 50% resource cost reduction. You can get to that 50% quite easily with just those items. Roll area damage on your shoulders, roll area damage on your pants, roll area damage on other things that can have area damage. Try and get resource cost reduction area damage because this is an area damage kind of thing. But for gloves, chest, helm, amulet, and offhand, you're using Tau Roshes. For your bracer and your shoulder, we are using Ogilds. Now, Ogilds is a crafted set. So do your bounties, get the plans for Ogilds, teach it to your blacksmith, craft Ogilds bracers and Ogilds shoulders. And the reason we do that. The two set bonus for Ogilds, reduce damage taken by 15%, increase damage dealt by 30%. Bam, huge damage increase, 30% additional damage. And then the three set bonus says, minus 30% damage from elites, plus 30% damage to elites. 
So we're reducing damage taken from the normal Joe Schmo run-of-the-mill enemies by 15% and increasing our damage against them by 30%. We're taking 30% less damage from elites and increasing our damage against them by a base 30% damage increase at all times against rank-and-file enemies, against Rift Guardians, against elites, against champions. It's beautiful. That's why we take Ogles. And then for our belt and our pants, we're taking Captain Crimson's. And the reason we take Captain Crimson, the two set bonus says 6,000 life per second. Okay, so we get massive survivability because we're having 6,000 life per second. Beautiful. And then reduces cooldown of all skills by 20% and reduces all resource costs by 20%. Okay, so let's take that teleport that has an 11 second cooldown without Aetherwalker, you just reduced it by 20%. And if you have a 50% reduction in your resource or in your cooldown reduction, then you can take teleport from 11 seconds to 5.5 seconds, which is a little better. And then you one cast of Meteor Shower will basically eliminate teleport. See how cool that is? That's just a two set bonus. The three set bonus says, here we go. Damage dealt is increased by a percentage of your cooldown reduction. Well, we just got 20% cooldown reduction from the two-set bonus. And we now get damage dealt increased by a percentage of your cooldown reduction. Interesting. Another base damage increase. And then, also on three-set bonus, damage taken is reduced by a percentage of your cost reduction. So the two-set bonus, which gives us a 20% cooldown and resource costs, now gives us another base damage increase because the damage dealt is increased by resource or damage increase is increased by percentage of cooldown reduction. Damage taken is reduced by a percentage of resource cost reduction. So the two set bonus is proccing the three set bonus. That's why we take Captain Crimson's. Okay, and then for boots, we are going to take Nilfer's Boast. Now there are several items in the game that directly affect Meteor. Nilfer's Boast is one of them. What does Nilfer's Boast do? It says, increase the damage of Meteor by 600%. That is a seven time multiplier. So if you, oh, I'm sorry, I did my math wrong on the other part where it increases by 2000%. I should be increasing it by 2100, not 1900. So if we do the increase multiplied by 2100, then our number is actually 5.2 billion. Okay, so I'm sorry, it's an increase by 100 more. Okay, so we're getting a, a seven time multiplier to our meteor. Okay, beautiful. And then, what does that sort of say? If the meteor attacks three or fewer enemies, the damage is increased by anywhere from 675 to 900%. And I got 828%. So I'm increasing it. If, it. if it hits three or fewer enemies, then it is increased by 9.3 times. Okay. Very cool, because I just now buffed the damage of Meteor. Beautiful, right? Making it even more bonkers. Our two rings that we're taking is one, Convention of the Element and two, Halo of Karini. Very important that you have these two rings. Convention of the Elements says gain 150%, so basically gain double damage to a single element for four seconds. Okay, this non-static effect rotates through the elements available to your class. For wizards, we get arcane, cold, lightning, and fire. And it will rotate through those elements in the following order. Arcane, cold, fire, lightning. We do not use holy. We do not use poison. We do not use physical. We use arcane, cold, fire, lightning. So those are the four elements we're rotating through. We're getting 2.5 times damage to the element when it's on that element. And the only element we're not actively casting is cold. So for 15 out of the 20 second rotation, because we're going through four elements um, at four seconds, oh, that's 16. So for 12 out of the 16 seconds, either our storm armor or our familiar or our meteors that we're casting is going to be buffed. We're basically 
getting a huge damage buff with Convention of the Elements. And then Halo of Karini says you take 71% less damage for 5 seconds after your storm armor electrocutes an enemy at least 15 yards away. 15 yards away from you is not that far. It's like 17 to 20 pixels on your TV screen away from you. It's really not that far away. So whenever your storm armor electrocutes an enemy, you'll see little bolts of lightning come down from the sky and electrocute enemies, procking your Taurasha meteor of the electrical type, so satisfying the electrical portion of Taurasha's, it will then give you anywhere from 60 to 80% damage reduction. I have 71% on my Halo of Karini. So for your two rings, Convention of the Elements, Halo of Karini. For your follower, because in season 23, which was earlier this year, actually I think it might have been late last year, um, they reworked the followers and gave us the ability to equip followers with items that emanate. So basically we can take legendary powers from certain items and use them, but put them on, their, put them on the followers so we can take a whole bunch of legendary powers in addition to our own legendary powers and basically make solo players um, more viable and gives them a huge quality of life increase because I'm basically a solo player so I always take a follower with me and this is what I like to put on my follower so for follower weapons and offhands you can choose whatever you like you can choose whatever follower you like if you take the Templar not only do you get life regen but you also get an increase to resource regeneration okay so the follower will keep you healed give you life regen and resource regen because there's the heal that he gives you. The second skill at 10 gives you life regeneration if you choose it. The third skill lets him charge and stun enemies. P.S. That will proc Bane of the Trapped because enemies take more damage against um, enemies take more damage when they're under control impairing effects. When the Templar stuns an enemy, that's a control impairing effect. They take more damage. Procs Bane of the Trapped. And then the last the last skill you can take at level 20 for your follower for the Templar increase your resource generation. Um, if you take the Enchantress, she's going to increase your attack speed, but because we're not dealing with breakpoints like we were with the Firebirds when we're casting Disintegrate, you want to have, um, you're dealing with breakpoints. Um, we don't need to worry about that with Talrosh's rework. And then if you take the Scoundrel, he will increase your critical strike, both your chance and your damage. So it's just a matter of the playstyle you want to do, if you want to have more attack speed, if you want to have more life and more resource, if you want to have more crit, you can choose whatever follower you like. The weapon and the offhand don't matter. You can get the best weapon you want for them, equip them with whatever you like. But remember, they can equip stuff that emanates and you can take legendary powers. So for the helmet and the belt, you want to do the Sages set. Because what does the Sage set do? It gives them a huge buff to whatever skill or whatever stat they need. Strength, Dex, and Intelligence, a huge 250 increase to that. And then the three set bonus says double the amount of Death Breaths that drop, and that emanates. So when you're going into your Nephilim Rifts and you're killing champions, elites, and the boss that drops Death Breaths, all of a sudden you're getting twice the number of Death Breaths that drop because of Sage's set. So on the helmet and the belt, you take Sage's set. For the pants and the boots, you take cane set. Why? Because the three set bonus says when a greater rift keystone drops, there's a chance for another one to drop. So you're increasing your greater rift keystones that drop. So you get more death breaths, you get more keystones when you're running your rifts. That's why we take sages and canes. Now, for gloves on your follower, I like to give them the gloves of worship because look what it says, Shrine effects less for 10 minutes. Wow, so when you get those enlightened shrines, or you get the frenzied shrines, or you get the protection shrines, those effects will now last for 10 minutes. Beautiful, right? For shoulders, give them the spalders of Zakara, and all of a sudden, no more repair bills at the blacksmith because your items all become indestructible. Um, I haven't really found a chest armor that emanates that I like. Um, I think cinder coat um, and gold skin emanate. I just, I don't care about them. 
So I just give them a kilo of curry ass just because that's what I have available, whatever. Just give them a kilos. For the amulet, give your follower the flavor of time because the legendary power says pylon effects now last twice as long. So your conduit pylons, your channeling pylons, your speed pylons, and your shield pylons now last twice as long. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And then the other thing I like to give to my follower is the nemesis spacers because look what happens. Shrines and pylons now spawn enemy champions and it emanates. So every time you hit a shrine or a pylon, you can finish your rifts faster because it's spawning enemy champions. So you're getting the orbs faster, getting your bar filled up faster, so you're completing the rifts faster. You get your loot faster. It just makes everything faster and it emanates. So give nemesis spacers to your follower. Now, very, 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 very important. Give your follower a Ring of Royal Grandeur. The best place to find Ring of Royal Grandeur is the Act 1 Bounty Cache. If you're on Torment 16, you're guaranteed to get two legendaries from the Bounty Cache with a very high probability of getting three legendaries from the Bounty Cache. Do Act 1 Bounties, get the Bounty Cache, open it up, look for the Ring of Royal Grandeur. You're going to need two of them. One for your follower, one for the cube. Because we're taking three sets on our on our character. We're taking Captain Crimson's, we're taking Ogold's, and we're taking Talrasha Five Piece, which the Ring of Royal Grandeur says reduce the number of items required for set bonuses by one to a minimum of two. So we can take five Talrashas, two Ogold's, two Captain Crimson's, Ring of Royal Grandeur in the cube, and take the full set bonuses of all those sets. The other thing, other ring you can give to your follower, you can give them a convention, you can give them an Arkenstone, Stone, you can give them a Stone of Jordan. The other ring that you give your follower doesn't really matter. The only thing that they're required to have is the Ring of Royal Grandeur because they're using Sages and Canes. And then for the follower item, this is most important, you want to give your follower the item that makes them immune to death, where it says your follower cannot die. For the... For the Templar, that is called Enchanting Favor. For the Enchantress, the item is called Smoking Thurble. For the Scoundrel, the item is called the Skeleton Key. Those three items will make your followers immune to dying. Okay, so that's the gear you get for your followers. Now let's look at the skills that I'm using. Like I said previously, I have been playing Wizard since 2012. And for as long as I can remember, I have been using three passive skills with two active skills. And for the longest time, I was using Disintegrate with Electrocute. So I would cast Disintegrate until my Arcane Power was gone. I would cast Electrocute to re refresh my Arcane Power. And I would just cycle between Disintegrate and Arcane Power. Um, and then my other, other three cooldowns... Um, they're just passive, passive skills. Now, prior to the Talrasha rework, Familiar did not proc Talrashas. Storm Armor did not proc Talrashas. Magic Weapon did not proc Talrashas. So you had to put other skills on your bar, sacrificing a passive, sacrificing other skills you'd rather use so you could take things. Now, I'm also using Teleport. And prior to the Talrasha rework, you were required to take the Calamity Rune because it says cast a short range wave of force that stuns after teleporting. That satisfied the arcane power or the arcane portion of Talrasha's elements to get your four stack of Talrasha's. No longer required for that. So you can take whatever rune you want. I like Safe Passage because it reduces the damage you take for like three seconds after you teleport. And with Aether Walker, you're just constantly teleporting because we have so much resource cost reduction. Okay, so take your magic weapon deflection, take your teleport, any rune you want. If you want to do wormhole so you can just zip around even faster, do whatever you like. I just like to have safe passage because it's uh, it's a survivability thing for wizards because wizards are we're we're squishy right so the more survivability we have the better it is for everybody now for our familiar we are taking arcanaut because while the familiar is active you regenerate arcane power so we're increasing our arcane power generation. 
base arcane power generation is 10. I'm up to 17 because of this. And because it's arcane based, it's satisfying the arcane portion of Taurasha based upon one of our passives, and I will go over that in just a moment. So take Familiar Arcanaut. Then you also want to take Storm Armor because we're using Halo of Karini. And then we're going to take the Rune, Power of the Storm, which reduces the arcane power cost of all skills while Storm Armor is active. The reduction is 20%. It's beautiful. So we're now reducing even more the arcane power cost of all of our skills, basically Meteor, because the only thing we're going to be casting is Meteor. So that, the arcane, I'm sorry, the, the storm armor, will now satisfy the lightning portion of Talrasha. So we have the arcane portion satisfied by our familiar, the lightning portion satisfied by our storm armor, and then for ice, you can, you can take any ice skill you want. If you want to take Frozen Orb, you can. If you want to take Glacial Spike on your Magic Missile, you can. If you want to take, for example, the Shock Pulse Explosive Bolts that turns it to cold, you can. If you want to take Blizzard, you can. If you want to take your Ice Hydra, you can. If you want to take your Ice Twister, you can. You can pick any ice skill you want. The reason that I like the black hole absolute zero is because what it does is it pulls in enemies and holds them there, which procs Bane of the Trapped, the most powerful gem in the game. So that satisfies the ice requirement. So we have arcane, lightning, and ice satisfied on Talrashas. We need to have a fire skill, and we have to have meteor. The only... There's only three meteors that cast fire. The unruined meteor, meteor shower, and um, molten meteor. So the unruined meteor is a fire meteor. If we do meteor shower, that is also fire. And if we do molten impact, that is also fire with a caveat that it now has a 15 second cooldown. But this is Taurash's bombardment. We don't want to have a cooldown. And Meteor Shower doesn't help us because of something else we're using. So we already have the Ice portion satisfied. We have the Arcane portion satisfied. We have the Lightning portion satisfied. So instead, we're just taking the Unruined Meteor. Okay? Now, for passive skills... We are taking Galvanizing Ward, because what that does is, as long as we have not taken damage in the last five seconds, we get a protective shield that absorbs the next 60% of our life in damage. So it basically gives us survivability. Great. We are then taking a free life with Unstable Anomaly, so when you receive fatal damage, you emit a re repulsive wave that is equal to 400% of your maximum life, and a, like a shockwave that knocks back the enemies and stuns them for a few seconds. So instead of dying, we proc Bane of the Trap, get extra damage, and we get a free life, okay? We take that. Oh, whoops, sorry. And then we're going to take Astral Presence, so it increases our maximum arcane power and arcane power regeneration. Beautiful. And then this right here, Elemental Exposure, is why familiar storm armor um, satisfy the requirements for Talrosh's elements. I tried it with Audacity because you'll you'll when I show you what this playstyle is like when we go through a rift, you'll see that I'm a lot closer than 30 yards from the enemies. And so you would think, well, why wouldn't you eliminate the free life and take Audacity? I mean, you could if you wanted to. I choose not to. Um... But Elemental Exposure says damaging enemies with Arcane, Cold Fire, or Lightning will cause them to take 5% more damage from your attacks for 5 seconds. Each different damage type applies the stack, stacking 4 times. And because it's causing them to take more attacks, more, more percentage of damage from me, then it's satisfying the requirements. So now Familiar satisfies Arcane, Storm Armor satisfies Lightning. Those are passive abilities that are going off, but satisfying... Talrashes, all because of elemental exposure. Now, in the cube, there are two other items 
that affect Meteor. One is the Grand Vizier, the other is the Smoldering Core. The Smoldering Core says lesser enemies are now lured to your Meteor impact sites. Okay, cool. But it doesn't affect champions, elites, rift guardians, and bosses. Only lesser enemies. And since we're getting a reduction in our teleport, we're just zipping around looking for the champions, the Smoldering Core doesn't affect champions, so why take it? Instead, the Grand Vizier says, reduce the arcane power cost of Meteor, which normally costs 40. We're going to chop that in half, 50% reduction in the arcane power cost of Meteor. Oh, and what else does it do? Increases their damage by 400%. So multiply their damage by five times. Because an increase of 400% is a five-time damage multiplier. Beautiful. Now, here's where it gets absolutely bonker. A brand new legendary power for Mempo of Twilight. Meteor Shower Rune is now applied to all cast meteors. Doesn't matter if you take Star Pact or Comet or the... Lightning Meteor, or if you take Supermassive, Meteor Shower Rune is applied to all cast Meteors. However, if you choose the Meteor Shower Rune, it is not going to double dip. So you won't get Meteor Shower upon Meteor Shower. You'll just get one Meteor Shower. So when we cast our unruned Fire Meteors, we're going to get really super big meteors in meteor shower formation dropping all over the screen completely bonkers that mempo of twilight is insanity to the max and then like i said you need your second ring of royal grandeur put it in the cube because reduces the number of items needed for set bonuses by one to a minimum of two so for a six set bonus you need five pieces for a three set bonus you need two pieces that's why we can take ogles that captain crimson's and Tarash's all in one build because of the ring of royal grandeur now, I have not put in anything to my Paragon. Absolutely nothing. Paragons, this is basically like you're a fresh 70, um, the season journey, you've gone through chapters 2, 3, and 4. Wizards get Tal Rasha this season, and if you find the Mempo of Twilight, find the Grand Vizier, cube those, find your Halo of Karini and your Convention of the Elements, find an Aetherwalker. It gets really super bonkers super fast. Let me show you what this looks like now. So if you're in town and you cast your, oh, whoops, I did, I did black hole, but I didn't, oops, hang on. Skills on cooldown cannot be changed. <laughs> I forgot to put black hole back to cold, so it would proc the cold requirement for Talrasha. So we need to go to absolute, absolute zero. So we cast our, Ice, Black Hole, you can see Tal Rosh's elements counting down. If we cast our Fire Meteors, we have two. Um, Need more time. Because, because we didn't attack and you see that little purple ball fly out, that's our Arcanaut. Uh, but we don't, have, we don't have Lightning because our Storm Armor is not hitting anybody. As soon as the Storm Armor hits other people, other enemies, that will satisfy the Lightning requirement. And we can just constantly cast our Fire, because you can see that, that purple orb going out. That's our Arcanaut satisfying the Arcane requirement. There's our Cold requirement. And then our Storm Armor satisfies the Lightning. So let's go now into a... We're on Torment 16, just a regular Nephilim Rift. We're going to just start by casting the Ice Black Hole, and then we're just going to spam Meteor. And it's going to keep a four stack of Talrashes up at all time. And this is how bonkers it looks. We have our passives up. There's our ice requirement. There's our fire requirement. Look, we have a four stack of Talrashes. Look, we have a champion pack. The meteor shower, because of Mempo of Twilight, just annihilates because we're increasing the um, damage of meteor by, by 19 times if it hits three or fewer enemies. So it hits two enemies, increased by 19 times. If it, increase, if it hits more than three enemies, then it's increased by seven times because a 600% a, a increase is seven time multiplier. This is Ruins of Corvus. It's kind of bad for teleport because it's confined hallways, confined rooms. I mean, when you get big grand groups like this, see we're within 15 yards, but we're not taking audacity. But look, things are just blowing up. Now I have a rank 50 Boon of the Hoarder on just because I'm screwing around. You're, 
You can choose whatever gems you like. Bane of the Trapped is a staple for every build because it's the most powerful gem in the game because enemies take more damage when they're under the effect of, of control impairing effects. And then at, at rank 25, it causes you to have an aura that reduces their uh, movement speed, which is a control impairing effect. Oh, whoops. We... Where's our four set bonus? What have we... There we go. There's our four set bonus because I was talking and I just let it fall off. Uh, Ruins of Corvus is kind of bad for that because you have to keep attacking to keep your four set bonus up. But look at this. You're just you're casting meteor shower and the enemies are just dying. And you just keep refreshing because whenever you cast meteor, you're getting that little purple blob out from your familiar which there's your two different elements so all you have to cast is meteor that's all we're casting and then because we're doing the mempo of twilight which applies the meteor shower rune to any cast meteor we're we're getting huge fireballs now let's say let's say you decided to take the meteor shower rune okay look it gives you the meteors are just smaller. Look, you see how the, the thing on the ground is just smaller? They're just tiny. They're still fire, but they're just kind of tiny. If you want to take... Oh, no, no, not, not that. If you want to take the Comet Rune and call down huge ice meteors, you can. If you want to take the the thunder crash and have lightning meters lightning meteors come down and just cover the ground with lightning guess what you can you can play however you like um a word of a word of warning with the star pact <clears throat> so star pact expands all remaining arcane power so it's going to take your arcane power from full to nothing but it's going to because of mempo twilight it's going to give you meteor shower for your star pact but these little star packs that are going off because you have no arcane power is not going to do as much damage as when you have full arcane power. That's why I don't like doing star packs. That's why I like to just have an unruined meteor. And if you've selected a rune on your meteor and you want to cancel it, select a different skill, then go back to meteor, but don't select any runes. And now all of a sudden, instead of little fire meteors, you have big fire meteors. And that mempo of twilight just attaches meteor shower to all of your cast meteors. Okay, so now we have a speed pylon and we get a champion pack as well as an elite. And so we're just gonna be getting a whole bunch of death breaths. We're just gonna be getting a whole bunch of things. So I just got 12 death breaths. So two sets of six because of um, sages doubling the amount of death breaths that drop. And all we're doing is spamming meteor the Mempo of Twilight is causing Meteor Shower on any Meteor we cast. The enemies are just being annihilated. This is Talrosh's Bombardment. This is why I call it Talrosh's Bombardment, because we're just bombarding the screen with Meteor. <laughs> and because it's a Meteor Shower, it's area damage. This is why this is a very area damage intensive build. So the more area damage you have, the more damage you're going to be doing, because all you're casting is area damage. This is, this is what it looks like. All you do is you open up by casting your ice black hole, you have your three passes on, and your passes will satisfy the other three elements of Tarasha. Now, did I grab that well? No, I didn't. So now I'm getting more XP until I reach the threshold of those. We're just keeping a four stack by just spamming the meteor. You'll notice that my arcane power is dipping. So let's go into my paragon. Let's go to a um, utility. Let's take resource cost reduction, put it to the max. Now look, when I cast meteor, it doesn't really affect the arcane power at all. It just stays at full all the time. So you can just cast it. You can zip around with your teleport. Beautiful, right? Oh, there's six more death breaths. Beautiful. Just, just keep spamming the meteor. And because you have your familiar that's also casting that purple blob, you'll be <clears throat> satisfying Talrosh's elements. Now I have to either go up or I, I think I have to go down. So I'm just going to teleport waiting. around. Still casting meteor to satisfy our, satisfy Talrosh's. Oh, whoops. I got too close to the enemies. They got some hits off. I'm sorry about that. And here we go to the next level. All right, we are... Where are we? I need healing. See, the 
Tarash's bombardment just annihilates everything. It's beautiful, right? I think this might be uh, Great Hollow Island. I'm just looking at the layout, and it's not snowy, so it's not the Eternal Woods. This is Great Hollow Island. Oh, we got sand wasps. Okay, so the sand wasps attacked us because we, yeah. So again, oh, and there's our free life. So attack with ice, put on our three passives, attack with meteor, spam meteor, and you'll have your four stack of Talroshes. Oh, crying out loud. I stood in the explosion of the, of those. So four stack of Talroshes, Rift Guardian's dead. Um, Kind of bad because we died, so we had to refresh our four stack of Tarasha. But let's keep going. Because this this build, like I said, is just kind of lazy fun. We're keeping our four stack up. Here's the champion pack. Look, they're already dead. <laughs> we're just getting we're just we're just having fun. Tarasha's bombardment. Like I said, it's just bonkers. <laughs> you can take any rune you want. Um, you can see the, the whenever the storm armor electrocutes an enemy. We're getting that lightning, that lightning meteor down. Whenever our little familiar hits an enemy, we get that. Oh my gosh! So yeah, don't don't let the enemies hit you because we are still kind of squishy. And this is what we do: we just we just summon, we just summon a whole bunch of meteors. Tarash's bombardment, this is what it looks like. It's just absolutely fun. We just have a whole bunch of sand wasps in here. And you can just spam Meteor. It's absolutely bonkers. There we go, we just killed another champion pack. And we can zip around, we can look for more champion packs. Oh, look, another legendary just dropped. Oh, that looks like the Ancient Bone Saber of Zalmokris. That's the edge of the area. This might be the last... last level. Oops. Oh, that was another champion pack, Death's Breath, Galore. There's a Veiled Crystal, it's the edge of the map. We're looking for the next level, or the Dungeon Stone. Refreshing our Meteors, refreshing our four stack of... Oh, actually this is... This is the, um, Not this is the Blood yet. Marsh. Because we have an environmental problem here. Okay, so where is the next level? There's more gold to pick up down here. Ah, bugger. See, I teleported into the enemies. Need more time. Okay, so... There we go, next level. So the next level, oh, we're in the, we're in a cave system, beautiful, but not really. So yeah, all you have to do is summon your, summon your meteors. It's, like I said, this is why I call it Talrosh's Bombardment, because all you do is cast meteors against the enemies and they just die. That's all you gotta do. And, and enemies just die. It's, it's just the way it is. You cast Meteor, and they die. Still waiting. Still waiting. I, we could go that way, but I want to go this way. Here's a champion pack. They're now dead. Here's a treasure goblin, bombard him, dead. Beautiful, right? This this build is just, it's a different way to play Diablo. We're not casting Disintegrate like we did with Firebirds. We're not really zipping around the room. We're just bombarding the enemies with meteors. That's all you have to do. And if you start off with your ice black hole, have your three passives up, your little familiar is casting arcane, your storm armor is casting the lightning, and you're taking care of the fire. Because your arcane familiar goes off every time you press meteor, you're constantly casting those two elements, and so your stacks are constantly being refreshed. So all you have to do, press one button, and you're done. Wait for that explosion to go off. That explosion takes so much time. And we get a ring. I'm unstoppable. 
Okay, so where are we supposed? Oh, we're supposed to go either down or we're supposed to go over here to get to the next level. Oh, this is the dungeon stone. So that's all you got to do. We we didn't really have we didn't have any paragon. Um, basically, like your fresh seventy. You just finished your chapter four. You got the Talrasha set. You you can you can start up, and as soon as you find Memple of Twilight, you can just become completely bonkers because it will give you the meteor shower rune on all of your cast meteors. So if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give me a thumbs up, rate me a like, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell so you always know when new content comes out. Also, please tell your friends about me so they can come and they can enjoy these videos and enjoy the adventures just as much as you do. Finally, and most importantly of all, please remember this. Diablo 3 is just a game, and games are meant to be fun, and you're supposed to have fun while playing them, so if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Meet me back here next time for new adventures and new content, and I'm sorry about the lack of content for the last little while. I've been going through a rough patch in my life, and, and I just haven't been in the correct mindset to make videos, and so I apologize about that, and I want to get back to a place where I feel good about making videos, but... With, with what's going on in my life and with my mental health kind of struggling, I'm, I'm really sorry that I haven't made videos for you very much. So please please be patient with me and I will, I'll make new videos as I can and I'll put them up as I can. I just wanted to put this out here because the rework to Tal Rasha is absolutely bonkers. And because Wizards get Tal Rasha this season, I think that those of you who play Wizards are going to have a lot of fun with the Tal Rasha build. I've done the set dungeon with it. It's super easy to do the set dungeon now, even more easy because of this build. You just press one button and you're constantly refreshing the four stack. It's, it's just completely beautiful and, and completely bonkers. And what is Diablo 3 supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about having bonkers levels of fun. So I look forward to bringing you new content as I can. And I thank you for your patience as I deal with the life struggles that I'm dealing with. And I hope to see you again very soon. But until then, I'm Z, signing off.